Welcome to another edition of the Insider Mailbag, brought to you by Red Raider Outfitter, the fans' favorite since 1975. Well, I'm Jared Johnson, and it's TCU week for the Red Raiders. Uh, they face another in-state conference rival, coming off the uh, big, you know, disappointing loss to Baylor last week, but uh, big opportunity against uh, undefeated number seven TCU, 11 a.m. Central Time Saturday in Fort Worth. So. Received uh, some really good questions surrounding the game and other things uh, with Texas Tech from inside the Red Raiders subscribers. So let's dive right into them. The first one comes from Red Ranger, who says, "Is it harder to, it, yeah, is it harder to cover the team and generate content after a bad loss like uh, Tech just had? What makes it more difficult, and what's your favorite part of a tough loss?" Well, <clears throat> it does make it more difficult, especially with what we're doing. I mean, first off, well. Initially, there's a lot to talk about in terms of what went wrong, you know. But then there's a point of every week like this where, you know, you want to cover it, you need to talk about it, but you have to flush it and move on, or it just becomes this just miserable experience. And what I don't want to do is make it just a miserable experience for you, the customers, the viewers, the readers, all that. Um, but it's a delicate line or balance in terms of, look, we got to cover. This is what happened. We need to talk about it. And, uh, you know, going overboard where, and, you know, the thing is, is we're blessed with a lot of customers. A lot of people watch and, uh, you know, are, are on Inside the Red Raiders or watch this YouTube channel. I'm very thankful for that. But people have different levels of what they want to hear. Like, I'm a type of fan, like I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. Uh, wound of the tomb, always going to be. Where if they lose, I just I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to think about them. I don't, you know, it's, you know, I don't want to like explore it. But not every fan's like that. You know, some some fans still want to explore what happened, you know, all that. And then you have fans that they want accountability. They want to you know get after the coaches and get after the players, which I, I don't understand. But I understand that that is a thing that some people want. So. I'm, you know, trying to serve everybody um, who have very different tastes and flavors, and that's that's uh, that that's that's the most challenging thing of covering a loss is uh, figuring out the right uh, mix of hey, we need to talk about this. This is a problem, and okay, it's time to flush it and move on. Let's look at the next opponent. So that's that's probably what I I dislike the most, and then naturally I. I think I, I'm built to be an optimist, and in covering Texas Tech football over the last decade, that's been a challenge, just to be quite honest. Uh, so with basketball here, of course, recently, that's been fun, but it's a lot more fun, and I think you, when a team's highly successful, you get, I mean, your your outlet covering that team is way more successful. So, I mean, I, I definitely, it behooves any reporter covering a team that the team they're covering wins. Uh, in terms of what my favorite part of a blowout loss, I don't know if I have a favorite part, to be honest. Um, perhaps some of the, it, it used to kind of like shock me and bother me, but I think I do get some entertainment out of how some people go so far overboard and how they start inventing some of these conspiracy theories of why this is happening, coming up with ideas that sound really far-fetched to me in terms of how to fix it and all this stuff. I, I feel like when things go wrong and people are looking for answers in all walks of life, uh, they start inventing things. And uh, at least in sports, uh, it's entertaining to me to see sometimes. Raider Fan 01 says, has there ever been another college game where three quarterbacks from the same team in the same game threw at least one interception each? Yeah, that is a really good question because <clears throat> I, I like research this, you know, and when you, when I read this, I was like, you know what, I, I don't know. I certainly don't remember Texas Tech uh, having that. Um, and so in looking it up, I couldn't find anything in college where it said specifically like a box score or something like that, or, or even a story where it said, and I spent some time on this, three quarterbacks to interceptions, but there have been games uh, where so many interceptions were thrown. You have to think at, le at least a couple players, if not three, uh, but that could be reverse passes, uh, running back passes, you know, all kinds of things. But uh, the NCAA record for most 
uh, interceptions by one defense in one game is, uh, I believe it's just a tie when I looked up, is uh, Oklahoma A&M, now Oklahoma State, uh, picked off Detroit 10 times in 1942, which I'm surprised a team threw that much in 1942, uh, but especially if they kept throwing interceptions. Uh, one guy actually caught five interceptions in that game, which is, I believe, the, either, yeah, it's tied for most interceptions by one player. And then uh, UCLA picked off uh, Cal 10 times in 1978. So th that's the record. You think if you pick off 10 passes, somebody got bished, right? <laughs> so at least two. Now, if three or, or more uh, quarterbacks specifically, I don't know. And then the NFL, that's only happened once in the last 20 years, and that was the Falcons in 2020. In 2000, I think it was Jacksonville or somebody, uh, but definitely it was the Falcons in 2020, three different quarterbacks threw at least one interception uh, in a game against the Patriots. So, uh, it's it, you know, one time in 20 years in the NFL, and I can't even find, like, for sure a mention uh, in college. So it's definitely a rare thing, uh, and uh, that's – that's a really good question, and that's something I should have thought of before. I mean, of course, it's a geez, all three quarterbacks are interception is terrible, but I didn't think, like, how rare is that? So, a uh, really good question, Raider Fano. The next one comes from Murdo uh, Coalition, who says, Matt Rule went 1-11 in his first year as a head coach at Baylor. He followed that up with 7-6, and uh, and then 11-3 and uh, the, the following year. Uh, he said McGuire was a part of that turnaround, of course, uh, with Matt Rule and Baylor. He said, given the 4-4 start this far in McGuire's first year at Tech and the excellent recruiting success he appears to be having, do I feel this could indicate the potential for an even higher trajectory here at Texas Tech than what was experienced during his time at Baylor? Well, Baylor was a unique thing because they were coming off all the, the Bryles um, implosion, you know, the suspensions and all the, all the drama there where that whole team just got blown up. Uh, so what Matt Rule and Joe McGuire as part of it did was extraordinary in terms of building that program back up so fast. Um, yeah, I don't think – so they had like a lower floor starting off. Um, I, I don't know that there's a correlation between the two other than Joey McGuire was a part of both. Uh, I, I do think there are brighter seasons ahead. I do still believe in Joey McGuire as a head coach. There are, they are recruiting better than we've seen in a long time. Uh, right now, after the big loss to Baylor, it sounds, you know, people don't want to necessarily hear that. And I understand that. But in terms of will it be a higher trajectory than Baylor and going to the Big 12 championship and then eventually under Aranda uh, winning the championship last year, uh, I don't know if I could say that. Um, I do see Texas Tech building up and then possibly in like two or three years contending for a Big 12 title. But there's so many other factors with the new teams coming in, what the schedules are going to look like, all of that. But... Texas Tech is trending up for a number of reasons. One is recruiting, all the facility upgrades they're adding. Um, I do believe McGuire uh, is the answer. I think he's the right fit for Texas Tech. In, but in terms of exceeding Baylor's trajectory, uh, I don't think I'm ready to say that. Texas Tech Austin says he really started following Tech football in 1988. He said, in every single season, no matter who the coach is, uh, Tech has suffered a complete butt-whipping blowout at least one one time per season, and not always to a head and shoulders better team. He said, besides being typical Tech, uh, is there any rational, rationale that uh, I can wrap my brain around to explain it? He said, maybe this happens to every team that is not a top program, but that is a constant that Tech has mastered. Any way to break the 35-year-long pattern. Yeah, I mean, I think my first thought when you when you said this was just look at Oklahoma State getting blown out. Was it forty eight to nothing or whatever it was to Kansas State? Like, I still I still watch that game and when I saw that score, I was like, this makes no sense to me. And Oklahoma State has been a model of consistency under you know Mike Gundy for however long. I mean, uh, so it happens. But the fact that it's happened every year, and you know, of course, I. My Joe and I may have jinxed it the week before saying, hey, you know, Tech hasn't just been totally blown out uh, this season. And then they got blown out by Baylor. Uh, what was it? Uh, 45 to 17. So, um, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to, like, pinpoint one thing with all the different coaches and so many different styles and players and eras in, of 35 years. Um, 
I will say Texas Tech has been kind of an underdog, uh, outlaw underdog. So, you know, there was a time where you could say a long stretch where Tech was always good to upset some, you know, higher ranked team in Lubbock every year. Now, most recently, in terms of like the Kingsbury era and most of the Wells era, that wasn't the case. But uh, even going through Tuberville, um, like I, like for for me watching Spike Dykes, Leach, of course, and then Tuberville, like they were good for almost one a year where they just up and just, you know, got after some highly ranked opponent in Lubbock, you know. So there's been some interesting trends uh, with Tech. The one getting blown out, I mean, I also think back to, like, even to the 2008 squad, of course, got blown out to Oklahoma, how dis- at Oklahoma, how disappointing that was. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, my, my only rationale is that they've been underdogs, it's an underdog program, and so, you know, sometimes you're going to get whipped. And how to change that, in my mind, is to get, improve on the offensive and defensive lines. If you have a good offensive and defensive line, you're going to be in almost every game. Uh, that and uh, experience coaching. You know, all you get experience is by, is by doing it or bringing in somebody, of course, who already has it. So uh, we'll have to see, um, you know, uh, if Tech next year can maybe break the trend. But uh, I don't, uh, I'm not ready to say that. I think a lot of teams suffer that one. It's hard to be consistently good throughout a whole season. And then if you catch somebody who's hot, you know, you get blown out. That's just the way it is. So, and then there's all these matchups and stuff like that. So, there's a lot that goes into it. But that, that's my best answer to that. That was, an, that was another good question. Some good questions this week. Tech Freak wants to know what is TCU's weakness this year? Yeah, they're not especially great against the run, stopping the run. Um, so that's one to watch for. And then also they've had some slow starts. Now they've come back and won all those games, obviously, but they've had some really slow starts. So if Tech can pounce and then run the ball uh, with success, then you know maybe they could spring the upset against TCU and Fort Worth. But they don't have a lot of weaknesses on offense. Overall, it's a really sound team. They're a fast defense. They come up with a lot of turnovers. Um, I, I can't think of anything in special teams necessarily as a glaring weakness. So really that's it. you got to hope t- TCU starts slow again and that you're able to, to run the ball uh, effectively. All right, 78 Tech. Ask. He said, most fans of some sports writers refer to uh, Tex Football Stadium as the Jones. Jones Stadium, etc. The full name is Jones AT&T Stadium. Um, I, he said, I'm not concerned with sem- semantics, but could we be subject to losing the sponsorship? No. Uh, if the corporation doesn't uh, receive the verbal and written exposure they're paying for, no. They're not going to lose the... Fans calling it the Jones. Every stadium has some kind of uh, nickname. Um, like Texas Tech itself has to say Jones AT&T Stadium and you know newspapers will I come from a newspaper background and they definitely like you would say the exact name but you know I, I, I don't write for a newspaper one of the big things for me and uh, with this gig was realizing like just because you have all these rules with like with newspapers doesn't mean that's what you should do I mean newspapers are falling out of style for a number of reasons and one is kind of like that rigid uh, Formality, you know, I'm glad I like for me personally, I have that base with newspapers in the in the formality, but it's the Jones. If you're a Texas Tech fan, it's not, hey, let's go to Jones AT&T Stadium. No, it's the Jones. That's where we're going, you know. So for me to sound, and I don't want to be to sound like, I don't want to be formal with y'all. If, if we're having a discussion like this, or if I'm doing a video like this, or in some of my notebooks and stuff like that, I want it to feel like we're you know at the bar having a beer, and I'm, and I'm giving you the scoop, you know. Uh, on Texas Tech, not Jones AT&T Stadium. I get your concern, but uh, no. And let's see, you get more questions on. He said, you think it's greatness that Tech has a prestigious sponsorship of the stadium? It is great. He wants to know basically the deal and the payment, um, how much AT&T is, uh, is paying. He said, well, here's from Tech's own website. Uh, he says the stadium was officially renamed from Jones Stadium to Jones SBC Stadium in 2000. Remember that. Following major corporate gifts in excess of $25 million uh, from SBC Communications. He said now it's, uh, of course, AT&T. The stadium was renamed because 
SBC Communications changed its name to AT&T. So that's it. $25 million, and that'll do it. That's a, that's a good chunk. I don't know. I know, like, I've read some things that some of that was through 2020. I don't know if there's been any. You would think it would be announced if AT&T and Tech had some new deal. But, I, you know, $25 million uh, is a significant investment uh, from SBC now, AT&T. So Texas Tech definitely got, you know, a, a good deal there uh, for for the naming rights. And but to go back to your original question, no, us calling it the Jones isn't going to affect that that deal. That deal's already already good to go. Tech's already uh, you know received that money. So, but hey, man, great questions from everybody this week. Let's see what Texas Tech can do against uh, again another in-state conference rival uh, against TCU in Fort Worth on Saturday. But for now. I want to thank you for watching, and until next time.